Jimmy Culbertson's place, right? This is your place. Yes, my room. Right, and it's October 29th, we think, 1985. And Fanny used to be my next door neighbor, right across the street, down there on Billiter, remember? Fanny has uh, graciously uh, allowed me to read a little bit about her history. She told me when we were neighbors that she was from Ireland. She and Bill had come over from Ireland. Bill came over first, and then Fanny came over later. About two years later, was it? No, oh, ten. Eleven. He was about eleven years in the country before I'd come. Eleven years? Yeah. Ooh, that's a long time to wait for your man. Well, I didn't know anything about him Yeah, then. yeah. You well, told me a fortune teller told you so. He was just neighbors in the old country of two families. Uh-huh. You told me a fortune teller had told you one time. Yeah. That you would see him coming up the the lane, was it? Walking up the no, through the window? In a motor car. In a motor car. Oh, yeah, okay. And I was upstairs. And you opened up the curtains, looked out? No, I didn't. I just looked and I thought, well, this is it. This is your prediction coming true. This is the story of William Culbertson, Fanny's husband for 50 years, anyway, wasn't it? It was more than 50 years. His grandfather was Moses Culbertson and grandmother was Wilson. His father, Moses Culbertson, and his mother, Martha Patterson. They lived on the same farm for five generations. Your granddad, William Culbertson, came to Canada in 1905 on a borrowed passage from his brother Joseph that was in Montana at the time and the price of two sheep that he sold. He just had 65 cents when he landed in Hamilton, Ontario. He was 25 years old then and bought a pair of overalls and went to work in a smelter that was making iron ties. Worked there for two dollars a day. Two dollars a day at hard, a very hard job. He came west to Manitoba to the harvest and stooped for a man the name of McLaren at two dollars a day. Then went on to the threshing machine at two fifty a day. And you say that was because he worked longer hours on the threshing machine. Uh, when in Patton, was that it? Hmm? Pat Patton, Saskatchewan. He went to Patton. He he did that. He and a few others headed for the woods for the winter in P A T T O M Saskatchewan Patum. Is that right? Some part. Of, it worked in the woods. Yeah. They worked in the woods. Yeah. And all they got was thirty-five dollars a month. And those were low labor. That's pretty cheap, right? For hard work. Eight hours a day in the woods? Yeah. Yeah, it was hard work. Were they cutting pulp? Or firewood? No. Or Big logs. Big logs. Yeah. They still had to the... To hand saw a man rather man. Uh-huh. Cross-cut saw. Yeah, those old cross-cut saws. They were something. <laughs> I've seen pictures of them cutting those big trees with those cross-cut saws. Then in April, he came out to Battleford to hunt for a homestead. A man named Herman Getty met them and said, Good morning, boys. Are you interested in going hunting for a home? As, these, as there were six of them, six men, huh? Six men looking for homesteads? Yeah. He told them where to go and what he thought was the best. So they hired a half-breed and a Democrat and two wild Broncos just in time in harness. First time in harness. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, it was a little fright. It was a fright. What do you mean by that? It was a fright. They 
writing in that would be a terrible yeah needless to say they done some bucking and kicking tamed down after time and headed south uncle moses hugh burns, burns and uh Mons Jenny? Yeah, Gemini. Gemini. Yeah. Mons Gemini. Ed Schweitzer. Ed, Ed Roland. Schweitzer. Switzer? Yes. And Ed Roland, yes. Jim Grace, and a few others. This was in 1906. They were going home study. Then your granddad, Uncle Moses, and Hugh Burns went back to Battleford and filed on their homesteads. Then to they looked for a job for the summer. He drove an outfit of six horses on the railroad, making the rail bed for a short time east of Asquith. Yeah, Asquith. Asquith. Is that near Battleford then? Asquith? No, it was on the way into Saskatoon from Wilkie. Oh, okay. So he was making the rail bed. Yeah. Raising the soil up, getting it high. Yeah. The horses got, he didn't like, it only stayed two weeks. They abused the horses. Yeah. And he, he didn't like that, so he only stayed for two weeks. He wouldn't be a part of it, huh? Then to Saskatoon, where they had started to put in pilings for the first bridge across the Saskatoon River. He wheeled concrete there for 24 hours on the first pier on a single plank. Ooh. There's nothing harder than wheeling concrete. It just is terrible. I don't imagine they had good wheelbarrows in those days either. They were just iron tired things. Yeah. And as Typhoid fever was in camp. He left, and as Hugh Browns was sick, got a flask of brandy and left camp and headed back to Manitoba to wait for the harvest. He got a job hauling out manure to the town gardens until harvest time. Went back to the McLaren again and got his job stooking and threshing. Wages still the same, $2 a day for stooking, Two fifty for threshing. Then back to the wood. Then back to the woods for the winter, to make a stake to go to the homestead in the spring. When sc when the spring came, they all headed for Saskatoon to get supplies. First oxen, so Granddad headed for Wadena to get oxen. He got two be beauties, and walked in after them eight miles. When he got to the city, he was mobbed. Everybody wanted the oxen. So he sold them and doubled his money. Can you believe that? Yeah. Then he headed back to Wadena for two more. The same thing happened again. He doubled his money. And as spring was come, he had to keep these oxen. They were not as good as the others. So his feet were sore with all the walking through the... City. He bought a wagon, a plow, and a harness, and yokes for the oxen and supplies, and headed for the homesteads 100 miles. An oxen doesn't travel very fast, does it? No, it took him a whole week, Yeah, yeah. Where did they sleep? On the wheels of the wagon. Then they put the blankets over the wheels. Oh, yeah, make kind of a tent? Make it a chain of a tent. Uh huh. And said one morning when I woke up, there was a big snake in the tree. <laughs> he was trying to stay warm too, huh? <laughs> yeah. But he said his brother wouldn't sleep on the outside. He had to be in the middle. Oh yeah, he yeah. Was scared. Yeah, of those snakes, huh? No, but the wolves and things. Oh. He didn't want to be pushed in battle. He didn't want to be pushed into battle, huh? No. <laughs> I like that expression. That's an Irish expression, isn't it? Pushed into battle? Uh, 
uh, the the canties hauling when they landed on the homestead comes when they were built their sod shacks on those corners. A raging prairie fire was coming about a mile or two away. A settler, Mr. Edwards, come on his pony, saw them and told them to get out. The oxen and plow and a and to plow a fire guard or they would be burned out and lose everything. So Dad, Granddad, being a good plowman, got the job. He plowed three furrows in a circle out from their supplies, and then two more a little further out. So that when the fire got to it, the wind was going down, and the fire stopped right there. And they were saved. The day, that day, they beat it out all along the way to get, the next day, they beat it out of there to get hay, safe hay for the oxen. They, they left there. No, they just went to looking for the hay, you see. A place to cut hay. Oh. <coughs> <coughs> no. First thing in the morning was to dig a well to get water on the corner of Grandad's quarter. Get water, they found it at 12 feet, good soft water that we used as long as we lived there. That was soft water. Soft water, yes. The other place where you came to, you told me about your hair. Yeah. Could you tell me about that again? What happened? That, I guess. Oh, okay. I'll just keep reading and I'll get to it, huh? Um, then to plow the prairie banks for Uncle Moses, shack first and a barn for the two oxen. Then da Granddad's shack and then Pat Hughes. Not the Granddad that you mentioned there was my husband, William. But you see, I was written for the family. Right, and then yeah. Called I understand, yeah. yeah. And Pat Hugh Burns. They each had one window and a door for their shacks. Can you believe it? That was it. Each yeah. man, yeah. One window and one door for their shack. So they completed the started, and then they started to put up the hay for the oxen. And then the firewood, as there was lots of dry wood along Framp. Framping Lake. Framping Lake for the fires had gone there before. So they got wood for the two of them, for the, no, for the three of them for the winter, as they had to spend six months to three years to prove up their homesteads. And they lived like hermits and nothing to read, only their Bible. So that must have got pretty stale by then. <laughs> I like the way you put that. That that must have been pretty stale by then, huh? So in spring, they started to plow the prairies, and as the Indians told them, the white man turned the wrong side down. <laughs> what did they mean by that? Well, turning the grass down, turning the soil down. They were turning the wrong side down. Yeah, turning the grass down. And then sort of. Uh huh. Their first winter was a bitter cold one, 50 below for the whole month of January and December, and drifting snow until the prairies looked like the waves of the sea or the ocean. During the winter, a Scotch family had a sad experience. He had come in with a wife and family of five, and she was nursing a baby. He started to build two strong no, a two-story sod house. And never got up any feed for his two oxen and a milk cow, thinking the cow they could graze out all winter, like they did at home in Scotland. So it ended up they had to get into the basement to keep warm, burning the furniture. Oh, man. They'd hauled the furniture all this distance and they had to burn it. And they looked for the furniture that they had, yes. That the Scotsman had. So the... The man 
the came over to Uncle Moses and said if he if he had another ox to go to the half way house he had supplies there so Moses said he would give the ox up Bill would go so poor Bill started out at daybreak with temperature reading 40 below and a ground blow snow drifting along all day eight miles when he got there no hay for the ox and no food for him only dead ox soup and biscuits made out of flour no baking powder salt sugar soda just rocks sat up all night in the hole with eight of them then started next morning breakfast of dead ox soup and hard biscuits two sacks of hay on a we slip like a Scotsman called it a wee slip. You know, it was a trunk of a tree that had met together and then like this. And then they stood back here in this hay. Oh. And that was all the accommodations they had. There was no bottom to it. It was just the that, frame. Oh, and they slept on it? Or, or I don't understand. What was that for? Well, it sounds like they had a schoolmar, maybe for you know those trees we call schoolmar. How they got yeah, the wine? Yeah. That's what they used for the sled. This was just like the wishbone of a chicken. Yeah. Yeah. That was sort of something they trailed behind the oxen in, huh? Yeah. I understand. Travoy. The Indians call it a travoy. And they no, had it's not the same thing. Well, well not exactly. They dragged it. Oh, it and was kind of a sled, boat. a sled, stone, like boat. stone boat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they had only gone one mile out of the Kelfield area when Mr. Tate's oxen started to stagger. So Bill told him to turn home as the oxen, as the oxen would never make the trip. No, he says, I'm afraid he will never make it. So the wind hadn't changed and Bill headed for Moses' shack eight miles away, walking after the oxen. When he got to a coulee, had to paw with his hands a road for the oxen to get up. He, say, he said his shirt was sticking to his back with sweat. It was close then to Mr. E Edwards. Edwards and called the and called there. Told him about the sad state of Mr. Tate and his family. Sad plight of Mr. Yeah. Uh -huh, of Mr. Tate and his family. So he said, I will go on my pony to Battleford and notify the police. So he made the 15 miles in one day. And in one week, the police was down with a carcass of beef, flour, baking powder, sugar, salt, tea, and coffee, roll oats, canned milk, and so on. In the meantime, Bill told him to come over to the Moses and they would give him enough to sleep, enough supplies to last them until supplies came from Battleford. So Mr. Tate, Mr. Tate came and got supplies. But by the time he got to where the dugout was, he couldn't find it. So he laid down his sack and walked around it all night to keep from freezing to death. And in the morning, it was only a few yards away from him. The supplies came and the police got up a lot of wood from Trampling Lake to keep them warm. Bill Hugh Burns went over and got some M-O-N for them. Mm -hmm. He got some M-O-N, oh hay, hay for them. Yeah. to last until spring when they came back and took them out but your granddad had never a thank you or a line from that family after saving their lives what do you think of that yeah and they took them and the police took them out and took them out and they died she died on her way and to all kids she nursed a baby all the time on her breast and had nothing to eat and nothing to drink and she saved the baby, huh? Living like a hermit all the time. Did the baby live? 
Well, you see, they never let him know anything afterward. Oh. Never even thanked him for saving their lives. Oh, isn't that a hard man, huh? That Scott. <laughs> yeah. Stupid Scotsman. But the poor mother died on the way out before they got to Wilkie. So I sat in him, but thank God your granddad lived through it all. He continued to break up the prairie six acres a day with four oxen and a wheel plow with a seat. Hugh Burns done the cooking and dug out some rocks. As Bill carried some markers along, and when he hit a stone, got off and put his put this rod in. He said that he had to keep a sack of at each end of the fields to wipe off the mosquitoes on the oxen. On the sheltered side was one mass. Oh man! On the on the side away from the wind, the mosquitoes yes. were thick. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Ooh, that must have been. Yeah, I said the blood was saturated. The sack was saturated with blood all the time. Oh man. With lots of them there, they didn't do anything to the oxen. The oxen left them and, and then got away, run away, and run onto the middle of a slough and stood there and they wouldn't come out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame the oxen. <laughs> they knew where to get away from I the think I'd do the same thing, yeah. I'd do the same thing. Let me get all these skeeters, he says. It made these sacks red with blood. They had them to use as a scrubber to level the furrows and make a mulch on top. To fill up all the open spots to save the moisture and rot the prairie sod. First, what was broadcast and in the fall tramped out with the oxen walking over it again and again. Builders, bitter, binders, binders and little thrashing machines come along. They had to have the grain to, to uh, they had to haul the grain to Cabell? Cabell. Cabell, 18 miles away? Yeah. For some years. Until the railway came in. This was a CPR in 1912. Yeah, and then the CPR opened up the country like hell. It was a good old timers opened up the country. Yeah, it wasn't the railroad. No, no it was this. The railroad came the because of the young boys like my husband and his brother and all those that he mentioned. They yeah. were all young men in their teens or in their twenties, you know. Yeah. It went to go west, young man, go west. Uh huh. Now let's go east. <laughs> they never got a frost side on it. It was the with the oxen being few and horses at the start. They had few head of horses at the start. Uh, let's see, they never got a No side on it. No side. Oh, I thought it was cleaner than that. I, I don't quite understand, uh, but I think it's some term. Uh, it'll come to us. It was the homesteaders that opened up the country, not yeah. the railway, and lived 100 and sometimes 70 miles from doctors or medical care. So all the old timers put up with a lot of hardships for their piece of land. Stout hearted men of this day from 18 to 20 to 25 years. Then in 1915 the crop, bumper, bumper crop of the West came along and Grain was 50 bushels to the acre, and in 1916 was also good. But a poor but a uh, 
1916 was also good, but a poorer sod. So your, so our. So your. Yeah. I'll come on the next page here, Fanny. This is the very bottom there. The ink was kind of like. Grande decided it was time to get a bird for the cage, as he thought he had enough saved up to go back to Ireland. And you were that bird, right? Sorry, sorry. Sorry to say that. You were the bird. Yeah. as he thought he had enough saved up to go back to Ireland for a mate. War or no war, he took off and landed home in January 1917. So in a week or so, I had a letter to say he was landed and was coming to see me. You see, we had been corresponding with each other for two years as we had exchanged photos. I had been going with his handsome brother, John, undoubtedly, for two years. <laughs> before, but we didn't seem to get along so parted. His parents was furious as they wanted me for their son John. So his father started matchmaking again for his son William. So this was how everything started. Then my father was up in arms. Surely I had enough of the Culbertsons. He didn't want you to go with William, huh? Yeah. He didn't want to no. So he told me to write and tell him I didn't want to see him, so I did, but his, he and his father had left home before the letter got there. They drove into Milford, our hometown, in a, some kind of a car, touring car? A jaunting car. A jaunting car, what's that? Oh, don't you know what jaunting cars? Mm -mm, no. Was it a special car? No, it was a two wheels. And four people could sit on each side and then drive her up in front. Four people on each side? Yeah. Like the back of a truck? Yeah, when uh, the, the, the backs went to each other and the driver sat up in front. Oh, yeah? And that was a jaunting car? Yeah. It's like an old sea car. Mm. Bachelor come into the yard in a motor car. So the car drove off before Dad had time to say anything. <laughs> he dropped him off, huh? Yeah. He just dumped him right there. <laughs> Cagey old man, huh? I was upstairs looking out of a window when the Prince Charming arrived. Dad had to say, come in. <laughs> Western hospitality, there's a bad standard out there all by himself, huh? So needless to say, my knees was knocking. Wondering how everything was going to turn out. I come down the stairs and met my Prince Charming for the first time, just with a handshake. After a while, my sister Maggie made tea. And as our setting room was upstairs, so Dad come along. So after tea was over, Dad left us alone. So we had a talk. As he had ordered the car to come back for him at 8 p.m., Maggie made more tea, and Dad and my brother Robert come up to have tea with us. So I took courage, then that everything was going to be okay. So we went downstairs, the car had landed, and we walked down to the yard to the car. He took off, he took me in his arms, and I had my first embrace and kiss when Dad came up behind us and said, it is up to you, Fanny, whatever you want to do. So I said, thanks, Dad. The answer is yes, I'm going to Canada. So then plans was made. Next time he come up for our wedding date, so I set 21st February. William was an orange man, huh? Yeah. And the walls of Derry were where the orange man had had a battle or something? No. No? I don't know my history very good. You know, I'm part Irish, too. I shouldn't say that, but I am. Because I'm, uh, I don't know much history of Ireland. That's the trouble. Well, anyway, let's continue on here. 
Well, you see, that what they called the apprentice boys was set up in the, in the walls, what they called the walls of Derry. And they were starved to death. They were eating rats before they would go to relief. They were under siege. Yeah. They were being under siege. They were under siege, so then King William came on with a book, and bo book the boom, as they called it, and they got free, the boys, the apprentice boys got free then. And that was when the Battle of Boeing was fought. What was that, the black what? Battle. The Battle of? The Boeing. Of the Boeing. Yeah. No, that's history I haven't heard before, no? No. When the apprentice boys was and made history to this day, we got home. We got home for a wedding dinner and a pleasant evening with the guests. And two violins for music. We danced some to pass the time to five o'clock when the wedding guests went home. We spent two days at my home, then goodbyes, and two days at the husband home. But alas, we thought we never were, we thought we were on our way. But at last, we thought we were on our way. But when we got to Kilmacroonan, Kil Bill's hometown, a policeman came out and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Culberson, you cannot sail. For your wife's foot is not on the passport. Your wife's photo wasn't on the pad. Oh, gee. And I left my picture in the, and then with the secretary, the municipality, and he was supposed to turn it in. They never put my picture on it, and then we weren't able to get. And if we had got out then, he had three cars of wheat on the track for sale, and they could have sold it at three dollars a bushel. And then when we got home, we only got a dollar seventy-five for it. So that mm -hmm. was the builder of that secretary oh. and he's the policy. I bet you'd like to have met him again, huh? Mm -hmm. Never met him. Woman or no woman, you would have probably tossed him in the slough, huh? Or in the sea? Mm -hmm. Woman or not, if you'd met that secretary that forgot the passport photo, you'd have probably tossed him in the ocean, huh? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think it was deep enough to swallow him. <laughs> I had to wait. We spent the rest of our time at his sister's. Mrs. Bull. Bull, yeah. close to Letter Kenny. When we could keep in touch for a sailing date. Where we could keep in touch for a sailing date. That didn't come until 23rd May. We had to be in Liverpool on the 24th to get our sailing papers fixed up. So we left Liverpool on my 25th birthday. It was a pleasant voyage as many wives and children belonging to Canadian soldiers was going on board. You see, food had got scarce in England and Scotland, so this big ship that had been brought over the first consignment that had brought over the first consignment of American troops, eleven thousand in all and eleven thousand, yeah. Eleven thousand in all and eleven hundred of a crew. Of a crew. So this ship was 10,000 tons larger than the Titanic. Wow. N name was Justi Justicia? Justicia. Justicia. We were escorted for three days by three destroyers and one battleship. The three destroyers rescued the ship. One circled the ship. Oh, circled the ship for continuously for three days and nights. So we had no fear of enemy mines or torpedoes. It was very calm, only a little ripple, two feet or so. After three days, the destroyers went back and the battleship come all the way along to Halifax. It followed you all the way. And the battleship stayed with us all the way. Yeah. Nine day journey? Nine days on board? Yeah. Oh, she could have come across in three days, but there was 2,000, I think it was 400 women and children on that boat. 
You see, they've gone over to see their husbands. Yeah, right, right. And they were detained because a restriction was passed that women and children couldn't travel. And that held up the women and children. Yeah, you mentioned it here. It could have been done in three or four days. This were, There were three huge smoke funnels, but only one engine was used all the way. Huh. Only one day we was followed by a sub, and they used... And they used... Two, two smoke stacks. Oh, two. You sure could tell by the vibration of the boat. And we were told that later on why. They were trying to escape the submarine, huh? They started up a second engine. Yeah. The trip that should have been our happy honeymoon was a nightmare for me as I was plagued with morning sickness. The ship doctor told me that if it had been a... It had been a rough trip that would have been in the sea. Yeah. As I was vomiting blood and the only, only thing that would stay down was sucking tubes of ice, cubes of ice. So I was glad to see land, I'll bet you were. Our train was waiting on us, in fact, 72 passenger trains. 72? When we got through customs and got on the train and headed west, a long trip by train. After a week we landed in Handel, Saskatchewan, where Uncle Moses was waiting with his fancy driver and buggy, so landed home to our shack of two rooms after leaving a big house that had seven bedrooms at home. That must have been quite a farm that you grew up on. The good neighbors had two cars loaded down with grain for Bill when he landed in Handel. So with a nice bank account in the Union Bank in Calfield and three cars of grain on the track, we thought we were well along the way. So our little band, uh, so our little bundle of joy landed in 28th December 1917. Who was the little bundle of joy? Hmm? Who was the little bundle of joy that landed? My little girl. Oh, who was that? That made me sick all the way across the boat vomiting. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so she was your little bundle of joy. What was her name? Ruby. Ruby. Yeah, I've heard that. She was born the 28th of December, 1917. So I spent my first Christmas in a hospital and Bill all alone. So in 1918, we bought a quarter of land, a new four over 90 Chevy car? Yeah. What's a four over 90? 490, that's what they what they call the 490 Chevy. Oh. That was the name of the car. You bought a new car for eight hundred dollars. Yeah, eight hundred and fifty was Eight fifty. Those were the days. Eight fifty for a car. Gordon just got a truck. Twenty. It was a good car too. Yeah. Well, the reason he bought the car was he had a little driver, and the little driver he was so frisky when you got in a buggy. When the car passed him, he was bound that he would follow that car <laughs> until he would drop. Is that right? He followed for a mile and he'd never give up. And he, my husband thought, well, I well, wouldn't be able to keep him on the road because they're making the roads at the time when they come to big rocks, the side of the road. Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. Just left there? Yeah. And he thought you were going to have an accident. So that was why he bought the car. Oh, time. yeah. And he bought it uh, at the same time he got a car. He bought a sewing machine for $45. Yeah. So our little bank account was getting spent fast. <laughs> that year, it never rained one drop, and the drought had started. Also, that was the year of the bad flu that took Moses' lives, that took more lives than four years of war. 1918 flu, huh? Yeah. Bill was very sick with it, also Hugh Burns. I didn't happen to take it, so was able to care for them. Can't and walked the one mile two times a day to see how Hugh Burns was getting along. So after two weeks, they were okay. 
It was a beautiful November, frost at nights and sunshine during the day. And oh, how I longed for the bicycle those days. For your bicycle. Yeah. You had a bicycle that you left in Ireland. Yeah. Mm. How far would you drive a bicycle? How, how Would you go for a long ways on a bike? Yeah, about 20 miles. One way? Yeah. And then back? Yeah, sure. Oh, I could go 40 miles. Huh? You like to ride a bike? I sure did. I was sure I had to leave that bicycle behind because my brother bought it for me. It was five guineas at the time. Mm hmm. Five guineas? Yeah. How much is that? Five guineas. Do you know how much a guinea is? Uh uh. <laughs> I'm pretty dumb. Oh, you're dumb. <laughs> a guinea, all I ever knew was cents. Pennies, nickels, and dimes. Is a guinea about a dollar? I just. I forget now my head's gone here. Not in a while, though. It looks like it's a pound. You see, 20 is a pound. 20 guineas was a pound. That was what you'd call a... It was the same as a shilling, right? Quarter. You should call a hundred quarter. Something like that. Oh, okay. I just forget now how to print it. It wasn't a great amount of money then. But it was a lot at the time. It was hard to get money in the old country at that time. You saw the figure, John. They paid eight hundred dollars for the car and paying twenty-one thousand. That eight hundred dollars would probably cost. It would take more to save up for that. Oh yeah, than right, for my right. You bet. You know, if you take the money value then as today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're working for two bits a day or something, yeah, like two bits yeah. a week. Yeah. It was a lot of money then. Uh huh. I forgot to say we landed at our little home in the West on the 16th of June, 1917. The hired man, a German, had c had the crop in. The summer fallow done and had started to cut and put up the hay. And the horse is all s stick and fat, slick and fat. And at home, they were horrified, a German looking after your place. All bad, huh? Yeah. Well, it couldn't be better. Well, it couldn't have been better. Taken care of. The German did a good job. Bill trusted him to be okay. Bernard Roth in 1918. No rain and very little snow. In fact, not enough for the sloughs or... Oh, not enough for the sleighs or cutters. There wasn't enough snow for uh, sleigh cutter. Yes, yeah. that made it double dry. There was no rain, no snow. Yeah. So you ran the car all one all winter. I guess you were glad you had the car then. Next came the Russian thistle <laughs> plague that followed, that rolled over the country and jumped fences and piled up grains them and then when it was filled up the rest rolled over the top and away across your clean fields and filled it with seed as they rolled along that must have been something to watch that happening yeah, it would fill up behind then it would go over the fence and away again then to the next one away again scattering seeds of the way like a tumbleweed eh? that was the russian thistle yeah tumbling weeds Oh, tumbleweed, okay. Then the grasshopper plague. Then the dust storms that lasted 21 days. We never saw the sun. And blazing hot every day. In 1927, we built an eight-room Aladdin house. There was a beautiful crop growing, and I had high hopes that I would be able to get furnished. But alas, two nights passed on right two nights past one right 21 degrees or 12 degrees Tons, isn't it? 12 degrees and the next 10 so the good huge crop as it was in the so a good huge crop as it was in the milky stage 
The house then cost four four thousand five hundred dollars. Three ply lumber was thankful for the space for five of us to move around. You had three kids by then, huh? So the crops didn't improve any until 1952. We had a bumper crop coming along, and the last one night at 11, we had hailed in five minutes 510 acres of beautiful wheat, oats, beautiful wheat, got fifty bushels to the acre and ours looked just as good. Our neighbors got fifty bushels to the acre and ours looked just as good. So my hopes was shattered again. I had we had only a little insurance, ten dollars an acre or on two hundred acres. It was just half filled and was broken down and too hard to salvage. So we swathed it and combined it to get it off the ground as this was a big crop of straw. I had to stand on the back of the table canvas and keep pushing it into the feeder so as it wouldn't plug up the combine. So a sad harvest for us. Joe had just got married and we had a, bought a house in Wilkie and he rented the farm but made a poor job of the three years on the farm. Bill enjoyed going to the curling rink to watch the curlers especially yeah. the ladies curling you, was he a curler was bill a curler no but he loved to watch some car he liked the game huh yeah hmm. we spent eight years in wilkie rented the farm to henry roche roche for four years who bought the section later on. Then we deeded then we decided to move to Princeton BC. How did you decide to move from Princeton BC? Well Jim was here. Oh I see. You see Jim. Yeah. He settled up in Princeton. When our son Jim had where our Jim where our son Jim had settled and bought a run down motel called the Pines Motel. Right there over by the police station, huh? We bought a very nice little house for $11,800 in a good location. Lived there, very happy, then Bill took sick and for two years was confined to a wheelchair. I took care of him most of the time as I had to go into the hospital two, a few times for checkups. Then in May 2nd, he passed away at 91 years and three months. I continued living there for three years more, then sold it for 29000 Prices had soared. I had a beautiful garden of flowers. Do I remember those? Your beautiful flower gardens. We lived right across the street from you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Which was the show place of town. And I was proud of the effort at 83 years. So ends this episode. That's quite a history. That is yeah, quite a history. I, I couldn't remember. Yeah. I couldn't remember dips or anything. Well, you sure remembered a lot. That was beautiful. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah. Here, let me put it in. No, if I could have remembered it, I would have made quite a book, but I couldn't. <coughs> So you ended with three children? You had three children. Ruby, Roy, Jim. and Jim, yeah. Ruby, Jim, and Joe. And Joe. Joe still at work in Saskatchewan. Oh, he still lives there. Jim died here. Uh-huh. What relation is Roy to you then? Grandson. He's your grandson. So it was Jim, Joe, and Ruby. Yeah. Jim, Joe, and no, Ruby. Ruby, Jim, and Joe. Okay, in that the order. Girl, the girl was first. Yeah, that order, yeah. But then I'll Roy very well. No, he's still the Pines Motel. Yeah, he's still there. Yeah. And sold that. 
in Zuma Tewksbury second day here as my men and turn camp for Sina. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that was the end of program. He worked hard to get it established but uh huh. You never saw anything from it, huh? Killed ourselves working eh? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Could you describe your farm in Ireland, what it was like? Hmm? What was your farm in Ireland like? You mentioned a great big seven-bedroom house. Oh, we had a hundred and eighty acres farm over there. Uh-huh. It was all handwork, you know, plowing, father done plowing, and oh, I done a lot of hard work in a farm. We spread a skill in the new and cleaning out barns. Mm-hmm. Digging potatoes and mm-hmm. anything and everything. You told me. See, there was mm-hmm. seven girls of us and four, four boys. And the boys, they didn't stay at home. Oh. Some went to China and John went to New Zealand. Oh. So the girls had to help at home. I see. Because yeah. there was only one brother uh-huh. in Rhodes. And he was younger than I was. Uh-huh. And I was 21. So I just worked like a man. Uh huh. You used to tell me you rowed a boat. Yeah, across the bay. What bay was that? Mulroy. Mulroy. Oh, yes. heard, yeah. Mulroy Bay. Yeah. It was two miles wide. And you did. Oh, it was pretty cool. Uh huh. You enjoyed those. Did you enjoy rowing? I did as long as my father was in one row and I, I was in the other. We could always get across, but if it was my brother was on the other row, I was always scared because I didn't have the... The strength, huh? I had the strength, but not the... The courage? Uh, the understanding how to get onto the waves, you know. Oh, yeah. He had to go into them sideways so you couldn't make it. Yeah, yeah, sort of angle into them. Angle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Instead of going in your way, you're getting out of your way short, short, lots of times. Mm-hmm. But you just had to go with the storm. Mm-hmm. And you and you rode across for what reason? Why did is that the way you traveled from town to town, or? No, my grandmother lived across the bay. Oh. And we had to cross the bay. When my brother left, we worked the farm over there. Oh, I the see. Yeah. Yeah. Things was there, and we had to cross to feed them and yeah, yeah. work on the farm. Two miles each way. Yeah, and then when you in the morning when you crossed this camp, then you wanted to come home and push it off. Blowing right in your wind, in your yeah. face, huh? Always, just like when I'm out in a canoe, Fanny. I go down the lake, and I'm paddling into the wind, and I come back, <laughs> and I'm paddling into the wind. Remember how the dry lake there, how the wind shifted on us all? Uh-huh. Time? Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I also remember trolling was not that's on the end of the line too. Yeah, right. That was a sad day. Yeah. <laughs> I was going like a sucker to keep away from the bloody shore, and he got a snag on his hook, and he says, "Oh, that's free." And we ever w- w- reeled the line and take a look at it. And I rode all the way around Dry Lake, and he had nothing on the end of the line. No way to catch a fish that way. <laughs> he never had a hook on his line. <laughs> the hook broke loose. Yeah. I saw one time it was so rough. The people stood on the shore and thought we never would make it. And then the sailors were gone this time. Big waves, you know, just... There was a... What they called it. The steamer used to come from Glasgow up there. And there was a... A channel. And then the storm followed that channel. It would come on and the, And the steamer would be able to go through that channel all the time to milk of tea. And they used to bring coal. They used to haul lime from the lime kill there to Glasgow, from Cranford to Kill, and bring the coal in for burning the lime and burning the limestone, and take the lime out in barrels. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Did you ever cut sod or? Uh Mm. What do they call that stuff? Uh, peat. Did you ever get involved with peat? Oh, yes. Worked the fingers with so thin or nothing like them. Hmm. My father and I was happy and I said, a hundred loads of stuff in the yard. He says, well, we won't get cold then. Mm-hmm. 
would go from fireplaces. Yeah, right. They weren't very effective, were they? You no, lost a lot of heat right up there. A the lot of heat went up the chimney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you tried to stop it, then you got to smoke. Right, so the, you're caught between the... The double and deep blue sea. Yeah, right, that's the expression I was looking for. Right, yeah. Rock and hard place. Rock and hard place was running in there too for a second, yeah. Yeah. What were your happiest memories of Ireland? I got on my bicycle and got away from everything. Oh, and rode those <laughs> 20 miles, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you know, just pedaled crazy. Didn't know what was on the end of it. And as long as I was on the bicycle, there were none of us. You were free? Yeah. Yeah. But I had a cousin one time, she said, should tell me a race. Home were coming from church. And her boyfriend was along with her and I was alone. And she said, I'll try your race. I said, okay, come on, let's go. So I was home about half an hour before she got. <laughs> <laughs> you and must then, have been very strong. And then she said, well, if I had as good a bicycle as she has, I could beat her. So and you I traded. I was afraid to give her my bicycle. Yeah. Huh. I had a good bicycle. I called her a lion. She came from Scotland. Uh -huh. And others were Irish or maiden. England? Huh. So. You must have been pretty strong. You were always fairly big, weren't you? Yeah. You were a tall woman. I was five foot eight and I weighed uh, what they call eight stone. Uh huh. And I know what that means. A stone is either 14 or 16 pounds? Yeah. Okay. 14 pounds, 14 pounds times eight. Let's see, we'll figure out her age here. 112, that's not very much, right? Mm -hmm. That's not, you're, up to, you weren't very heavy, 112. I was up to 100 and, or 200 and a quarter one time. You were? Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. What were your happiest moments in Canada? Hmm? What were your happiest times here in Canada? None. None. No. If you had it to do over again, you'd stay in Ireland, huh? I was sure stay in Ireland. I had every opportunity, but I turned it down. Yeah. You're Prince Charming. Roger the Hell, eh? <laughs> yes, sir. One of those two other opportunities that I had, but I, did, I turned them down. Oh, to get married? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but we don't really know what's going to happen. No, you don't know what's going to happen. Hills, you're good and far away, you see. Mm -hmm. you, you were a little bit adventuresome, too. You must have been if you took off on your bike for 20 miles. Also, what, what lay across the sea, everybody said Canada was so good. Eh? Yeah. And that land of milk and honey? Yeah. The roads over there wasn't very good to tang either. There was just not stones, you know, crushed stones. In Ireland? Yeah. But now when I was back the last time, you know, all hard to. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh boy, I wish they had been like this when I was riding my bike. Yeah, I'll bet you. Yeah. Did your bike have great big fat tires on it? Not big. Not big tires? No, small ones. Oh. And, and then they would always tell you, well, if you ride the bicycle too much, you'll have to walk it then. So we didn't get ridden too much. I remember one time my brother was crossing the other farm and it was seven miles to go around with the horse and a plow, the two horses and a plow. And then there was a young horse and my father, he was scared he'd get bad habits. So he wanted somebody to be with them and they were hatching up and on hatching so as they get, wouldn't get any bad habits. And this time when I was coming home, I was about halfway home.